The crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in human history. And the reason why is because everything that God has for mankind was accomplished through giving his son and Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And he did it all to save us from our sins and really to give us everything that God has for us. Yes, you heard it right. Everything that God has for us is through the giving of his son Jesus at the cross and his resurrection. And so I just encourage you today, as we begin this video number 23, and this is the last video in this Life of Christ series, I want to encourage you to keep your faith anchored in Jesus and what he accomplished for us at the cross, and make it personal for what he accomplished for you through his death at the cross, and the fact that he rose from the dead three days later to prove it. Oh, what a wonderful truth this is. This is the gospel. That's the main word used in the New Testament to describe the message that he's given to you and I as the body of Christ. It's called the gospel, good news. You and I can live on good news every single day of our life. And a wonderful thing about it is the good news is always greater than the bad news, regardless of what it is. And that's not to belittle any problems that you might have today, but the good news of what Jesus has done and everything that flows to us from Jesus by the Holy Spirit is good news, and that outweighs the bad news of our life. And so, praise the Lord. I just, I, I'm preaching already, but let's get into it today. We began looking at it several videos ago and looking at what I refer to as the details of Christ's crucifixion, which included his experience in Gethsemane, his arrest, the trial that he was put on by the Sanhedrin, and then the trial he was put on by Pilate and Herod, and then his scourging, and then actually him being put on the cross. All of that is included in his redemptive work for us. And again, I mentioned the details, but you know, as I was looking through it, there's so much more that could be said. And I, I'm giving some details, but not all of them for sure. But we're taking a look at some of the main ones. So we're going to take a look at it again. And I'm going to put it up on the screen, put myself in the corner. And again, this is from the handout that I've put in the last two videos. And I'm putting it in this video as well called From the Passover Meal to the Resurrection. Now, the point that we've gotten up to so far is that Jesus has died on the cross. And he made those seven statements on the cross. And the last two were, it is finished and then, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then right after that, we're going to pick up, and we see it right there from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., Jesus is buried. And I'm just going to read it from the handout. Joseph of Arimathea asked permission from Pilate to bury the body of Jesus, and permission is granted to him. Now, we learn from Mark chapter 15, verse 42, that Joseph of Arimathea was a prominent member of the council, which meant Sanhedrin. And so here was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of the religious leaders of the Jews of that day, who was a follower of of Jesus. He believed in Jesus, and this is why he went to Pilate to ask permission to bury him. But it also says in John 19, verse 38, that he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. Now, there are some who have a problem with Joseph of Arimathea and think that, no, he truly was not a true believer in Jesus because of what is said in John 19, 38. My position is that his actions after the death of Christ in pursuing getting the body of Jesus and burying it, to me, that shows that he broke out of some of that fear and, and, and did have true faith in Jesus Christ. And so point number two, the next day was the holy day, the first day, the feast of unleavened bread. Therefore, the Jews wanted Jesus' body off the cross so they could rest on the Sabbath day. Jesus was put in the tomb before the beginning of the Sabbath. So from sometime between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., most likely 
closer to 6 p.m., Jesus is buried and put in the tomb. And I don't mention the details of it in the notes here, but in main point number four, Pilate sets a guard around the tomb until three full days are finished. Now, the reason why he did that was because the religious leaders came to him and told him that Jesus prophesied that after three days he would rise from the dead. And so Pilate agreed to that and he put a, a guard and that would have been a group of four specially trained soldiers in the Roman army that were put in front of the tomb, one facing each direction, north, east, south, and west, so that nobody could come and secretly take Jesus' body away. And it was because of the religious leaders who were pushing this on Pilate because they were saying that Jesus was a deceiver and his disciples are going to come and try to steal the body of Jesus away just to, quote, prove that he rose from the dead. And of course, the religious leaders were absolutely wrong. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he would rise from the dead, but it would not be by the disciples doing it. It would be by the power of the Holy Spirit doing it. All right, moving on here. Uh, Saturday, or again, and this, uh, this handout is coming from the perspective of a Friday crucifixion. And if you believe in a Wednesday or Thursday crucifixion, all it does is ju you would just change the days here. So, Beginning at 6 p.m., that's when the, the Sabbath began, and it was a high Sabbath and a regular Sabbath all at the same time, but this was both the regular Sabbath day and the day after the Passover, which was the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th of Nisan. Again, a regular Sabbath and a high Sabbath. The first day of a feast day was referred to as a high Sabbath. That was a, It would have been a Sabbath day. So if the first day of a feast day fell on a Tuesday, that Tuesday would actually become a Sabbath. And then they would have the regular Sabbath on that Saturday. In this particular instance, the and this happened over and over again throughout the centuries, that the high Sabbath and the regular Sabbath were on the same day. And that's what happened with Jesus. Now, on that Sunday, that began, again, Saturday at 6 p.m. That's, that's when Sunday actually began. And this was the first day of the week. And also, it was the Feast of first fruits. Now, the Feast of first fruits was celebrated the day after the regular Sabbath that followed the Passover, and that can be confusing, but that's in Leviticus 23, verses 10 and 11. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept, or that, that means died in Christ. And so it's no coincidence that Jesus died on the Passover. And it's no coincidence that he rose from the dead on the feast of first fruits. Do you, do you understand that? It's no coincidence. God set it up that way because Jesus is the Passover. He's the true Passover lamb. He was the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. And as well, Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. And it happened on the feast of first fruits, a fulfillment of that feast. Looking again at 1 Corinthians 15, 20, what does that mean that he's the first fruits? That means of the resurrection. The first fruit was a small portion of the whole of the harvest. And so whenever a first fruit was given or seen, it implied that there was a whole harvest that was yet to come. And so here's Jesus, who is our first fruit of the resurrection, indicating that we're going to be resurrected with Christ at some point. I mean, physically resurrected. And so what a, what a glorious thing that is. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul would explain that and he would describe actually the rapture and is also described in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that says that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the air. That is when he comes back with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, okay, with, with triumph, okay. He, Jesus is coming back and we're going to be caught up. And that word caught up is referring to the rapture. It refers to a sudden taking away. And when that happens, you and I are going to experience a 
physical resurrection, just like Jesus, because he is our first fruit. And him rising from the dead means that there is a guaranteed promise that for all those who believe in Jesus, we're also going to physically rise from the dead one day and experience a resurrected body forever and ever. All right, from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., that's on a Sunday, just before daybreak, Jesus rises from the dead. And I give the scriptures in which that is seen. Uh, Point number one, Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany were the first ones to know that Jesus was risen. And that's in Matthew chapter 28, 1 through 8. And Mary Magdalene was the first person whom Jesus appeared to following his resurrection. And so Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany were the first ones that to know that he was risen, but Mary Magdalene was the first one that he appeared to. And hopefully that that makes sense. So when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, he had not yet ascended to the Father. Uh, Therefore, Jesus told her not to embrace him. That's in John chapter 20 and verse 17. And then as you can see in letter B, as Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany were on their way to tell the disciples that he had risen from the dead, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. And then he allowed them to hold him by the feet and worship him. So it, it brings into this equation, again, I don't have this on the notes, and I mentioned it earlier, there's, there's more details that could very much be described, but for the sake of time, I'm not going into all of those details. But it, this is sometimes referred to as the first ascension of Jesus. This is also described in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. I'm just going to read it. I don't have it on the screen, but Paul writes, Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That means those who were captive, Jesus took them captive in a good way and led them to heaven. All right. Verse nine. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And verse 10, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And so what happened in John chapter 20 and also Matthew chapter 28 is that Jesus ascended to the Father and led captivity captive. All of those Old Testament saints that were in Abraham's bosom, which was a part of hell that was non-tormenting part of hell, he went down, descended, and led them out of Abraham's bosom and led them to heaven. And then there in John chapter 20 and also Matthew 28, he came back down, okay, and then he appeared to Mary uh, Magdalene and Mary and Bethany and said, okay, basically, now you can touch me. Now you can worship me. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. And so there was an ascension that Jesus uh, did on that first day of the resurrection, an ascension and then a descending down back to earth. And, and some might wonder, well, how could he do that? How could Jesus do that? Well, the reason why is because he was in his resurrected body. He was not limited by time and space like he was in his physical body. He could come and go as he wanted, and the Gospels really portray that. He could could show up and then disappear. He could walk through walls. All of that in his resurrected body. It gives us some insight into what we will experience in our resurrected body. It's been said before that that the, the speed in which you and I will travel in our resurrected body is the speed of light or the speed of sound. It's just so fast that you're here one second and gone the next. And again, that's just a a theory, just a thought. But again, what the Gospels describe about Jesus' resurrection body, again, give us some insight into ourselves. All right, 9 a.m., at some point in the morning hours, he appeared to Simon Peter, that's in Luke 24, 34. And then at 11 a.m., Jesus appears to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And then, and that's in Luke 24, that's the passage where those two disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. And they were talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And Jesus walks up beside them and asks them, why are you sorrowful? What are you talking about? And I'm paraphrasing here, but they said, 
are, are, are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on here in Jerusalem? It's Jesus of Nazareth. We, saw, we thought that he was the one. But it's been three days, and he hasn't risen from the dead. So they thought. Again, that was on a Sunday sometime around 11. That's why I have put the question mark there because we're not sure. But it, was, it most likely would have been a Sunday morning. And they knew that was the third day. And again, I won't go back into the whole uh, story of which day Christ was crucified. But if you just go backward three days from that point, it tells you what day he was crucified. Uh, but again, they didn't realize it was Jesus. They were blinded by their own unbelief and sorrow. But Jesus made it clear to them that it was him. And their eyes were open. And they realized, oh, this is Jesus. And they said, our hearts did burn within us. Oh, what a testimony that is. And then around 5 p.m. that same day, that Sunday, Jesus appears to the 10 disciples in the upper room. And then I put a note there. Over the next 40 days, Jesus appeared seven other times before his final ascension to the throne. And I give all the scriptures in which that is stated. So I don't have this on the notes here, but it'd be a good thing for you to write down if you're taking notes. And it's this, Jesus appeared 11 separate times over those 40 days uh, from his resurrection to his ultimate final ascension. Okay, 40-day period. That's what uh, Luke referred to in Luke chapter 1, the first several verses. He proved himself alive with many infallible proofs. So there was, we can, when we put all the references together, there was at least 11 different separate appearances that Jesus made after his resurrection. And I think personally that is so, so important. Jesus made it very, very clear that he truly was alive. And he wasn't some ghost or wasn't some spirit being. Uh, no, he had a physical resurrected body. And with that said, I want to take a look at a scripture in Matthew chapter 28, and, in, and I'm going to put it up on the screen. All right, you can see it there, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 8, and I'm just going to read it. I won't go into detail about explaining it, but I just want to read it. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher, that's the tomb, and that Mary would have been Mary of Bethany, most likely, very uh, very likely Mary, the same Mary who was the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. I, I love that statement there in verse 2, because the, he rolled the stone away, and when Mary... When both Mary showed up, he was sitting on the stone. The very thing that was designed to keep Jesus in became a seat for an angel. And I think you and I can apply that same principle, that same truth to you and I, that the very thing that Satan intends to destroy us and to keep us from following God's will and keep us from experiencing the benefits of the cross, God will reverse it and we will end up sitting on it. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. In a figurative way or maybe in a physical way. All right, verse 3. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, that means the Roman guards, did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. Notice that's a past tense, was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen, as he said, and come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run and bring his disciples' word. All right, I want to take a look now at Jesus appearing to the disciples, and specifically uh, Thomas, whom we refer to as Doubting Thomas, that's never that's not a, a biblical description. That's just a word we tag on to him because he didn't believe in Jesus at the beginning. But Jesus showed up eight days later just to bring a special message and appearance to Doubting Thomas. And it says in verse 24, John 20, 
But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. That, and that means initially. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach forth your finger, and behold my hands, and reach forth your hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Oh, what a powerful statement that is. My Lord and my God. That right there is a proof that Jesus Christ is God. And that's how they viewed Jesus. They realized that he was God in the flesh. And then in verse 29, Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. You know, in that statement there, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. That applies to every single person that believes in Jesus after the ascension. See, we no longer see Jesus in the natural. But Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we don't live by sight, but we live by faith. And Jesus made that statement. He said, you believe me because you've seen me, but blessed are those who have not seen me, but yet believed. You see, today, if you believe in Jesus, that he died for your sins, that he truly is God in the flesh, that he's the Lamb of God, and that he rose from the dead, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father making intercession for you, then you are blessed. And that's not coming from me or any other person. That's coming from Jesus himself. You are blessed because you believe without seeing. Oh, what a promise and oh, what a blessing that is. All right, the last thing we're going to take a look at in this video and this whole series is the Great Commission coming from Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. And it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. You see, this, this great commission that Jesus gave the disciples then is also a commission for you and I today. And more than anything, it's a commission to go and preach the gospel and teach the gospel, make disciples, and that includes preaching and teaching, training them in the word of God and the knowledge of what Jesus has accomplished for them at the cross. That is making disciples. And it's not just for the fivefold ministry. It's for every person who believes. And that's, that's key. That's what I mentioned earlier. The main thing here is that we believe. And then from that faith, we go and do what Jesus said. And going doesn't mean that we have to go halfway around the world. You can go right in the world that God has put you and be a light, be salt, be a representative of Jesus right where you are. Let his character be seen in you. And as he leads, speak the gospel to people. Because we're a living testimony and we are a speaking testimony, a speaking witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said here again in verse 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be damned. You know, some have taken that verse to mean that you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. But that's not what Jesus was meaning here. Notice the second part of verse 16. But he that believes not shall be damned. He didn't say he that believes not and is not baptized shall be damned. He said he that believes not shall be damned. You see, faith in Christ and who he is, that he died for our sins and he rose from the dead, that is the key to being born again. 
And it's not being water baptized. Water baptism, as important as it is, is not needed for salvation. But in reality, it is an evidence. It's proof of an inward change. It is an outward sign of an inward change. That's what water baptism is. And then in verse 17, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it, uh, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, I want to mention this in regarding those statements in verses 17 and 18. Again, the key is believing. Believing what Jesus has said, believing what Jesus has accomplished, okay? It says, in, if they believe in my name, they shall cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues. Now, I want to present this to you. If there is a true born-again believer, that they're born again, they have believed in the gospel, but then they have been taught, and wrongly so, that we don't cast out devils anymore today. That was only for the first century. Or we don't speak in tongues today. That was only for the first century. Okay? And we don't... We don't uh, uh, tread upon demonic spirits because that's what taking up serpents means. It definitely does not mean literally taking up snakes as some has wrongly interpreted that. But they've been taught, again, wrongly that these things that Jesus mentioned here, again, casting out demons, speaking in new tongues, uh, laying hands on the sick, okay, all these things passed away in the first century. They've been taught that. But they are truly born again, and they have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. So what does this mean to those believers that do truly believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and he's brought about a change in their life, okay, but they've been taught wrongly about these other things? You know what they're going to experience? Or I should say it this way, you know what they will not experience, those believers? because they don't believe in this, they won't experience the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in new tongues. They won't experience that. It doesn't mean that they're not saved, but because they've been taught wrongly, they don't believe in tongues for today. They're not going to experience it. As well, you could apply the laying on of hands of the sick, and they shall recover. If they've been taught, no, no, we don't do that today. Well, you know what's going to happen is they're not going to believe that that's for them, and so they're not going to experience that. And I bring that up is because over the centuries, there are many, many believers, I, I could say millions and millions of believers that have been taught what is referred to as the cessation doctrine, which this cessation doctrine teaches that all of these things that Jesus mentioned, verse 17 and 18, that all of those things passed away in the first century. And so we don't experience them today. And that, that is a false doctrine because there's nothing in the New Testament that teaches us that these things passed away in the first century. In reality, just the opposite. All of these things that Jesus mentioned, casting out devils in the name of Jesus, speaking in, in new tongues, through the baptism with the Holy Spirit, taking up serpents. That means treading upon demonic spirits. That speaks of the authority that you and I have as believers in Jesus' name, okay? And also supernatural protection in our life. Uh, and then laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. All of these things are a part of the new covenant. Now, does that mean that, that we won't die from Bad things happening to us? No, not at all. That's not what Jesus is meaning. But it does mean that in the new covenant, there's supernatural protection from us. And I, I think if we were able to view our life from God's perspective and look back in our life, there are many, many times in, we've, in which we've experienced supernatural protection and we didn't even know it. And so I hope that makes sense to you. So there are still many, many believers today that have been taught this cessation doctrine. But it does not mean that they are not born again. It doesn't mean that they don't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. 
It doesn't mean that they can experience the, the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Jesus. Actually, in my life, I've known many believers who have not experienced the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and have the fruit of the Spirit, and they are wonderful representatives of Jesus. But because of wrong teaching, they don't believe in these things, and so they don't experience these things. If you don't believe it, you won't experience it. And that is what I'm bringing forth. And hopefully, again, that makes sense. And so our commission as believers is to go into all the world. It could mean that God's leading some believers to go into missions, but for most believers, it doesn't. It refers to you and I going into our world that we live in and being a representative of Jesus, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, as Paul would explain in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are ambassadors for Jesus. God is pleading with men through us. And so God wants to use you. Will you believe it? Will you obey him? I encourage you to do so. We're going to end there today with that. And I just want to pray and ask God for a blessing upon you. Again, as we close this series, it's been a wonderful series, and I pray that you've been blessed. And if you have, I just encourage you, could you just comment in the comment section? It would be a great encouragement to me just to hear back from you. So comment or email. You can email me at cornellministries777 at gmail.com. But I want to end with a prayer. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for everyone who has watched this video and this whole series. And I pray, God, your blessing upon them. And, Lord, as you have given us this great commission, help us to believe and obey and be a, an ambassador for you, Jesus, in, our, in the world that you've called us to. And, Lord, let there be a harvest of souls as the seed of the gospel is sown in their heart and mind. And we believe it, Lord, today. And we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, I pray that you've been blessed. So God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus.